I live on Shady Brook Farm. Um, it's, there's a 55 plus uh, community in the back. Uh, my wife was old enough so we could move in. Was, you know, I'm certainly not. Um, but our, our, that farm is one third of it is in Newtown, one third of it is in Lower Mayfield, and one third of it is in Middletown. Wow. To put this issue in perspective, I have a couple granddaughters, and one of them, she said, Pop, Pop, you know anything about the Revolutionary War? She thought I lived there for 20 years. And I said, well, not from personal experience. But yeah, they were, it was a fight against the, the British or American freedom, the Minutemen. She said, Minutemen, what's a Minuteman? I said to her, once upon a time in a land far away, some conniving politicians <laughs> worked to take the vote away from colonies and the Americans. And that was a very serious issue to Americans who wanted their vote. So they rose up in opposition and they weren't soldiers. <coughs> they were men and women from farms working classes, and just plain, ordinary people, like y'all. And they were a minute, came up and they fought for their right to vote. And they acted so quickly, they were called Minutemen. And she said, oh, okay, that's good. And she said, I'm glad that's done. I said, no, you know, it's not done. Because some 250 years later, today, some conniving politicians in a land not so far away, <laughs> Harrisburg, are doing the exact same thing. They're conniving to control our vote. And this is where the minute men and women of 2017 swing into action. When it comes time to dividing up after a census, where voters go, if we have the commission that does the dividing up, made up of elected officials whose seats we're talking about, <laughs> how do you think you're going to make out in that? Which gets us to what you may, can, and hopefully will do about it. It is very important that as many townships or boroughs as possible, pass a resolution saying we support an independent uh, commission. For those who have never stood before township or, or county commissioners and uh, they go, oh man, this is going to be, the, these people are brilliant, they know it. No, they don't. They aren't <laughs> those police leaders. They aren't, they aren't that brilliant. Um, they know, they may really know an issue or they may never have heard the word gerrymandering. In walks an example <laughs> of one who did know what he was talking about. Steve, <laughs> brilliant county commissioner. <laughs> See, there you go. See, so anyway, when you go approach a, town, a township or borough, what, what do we want to do? What do we do? A, a couple things, some do's and don'ts. Do be prepared with what you want to say. It would be all right if I were going to, um, and uh, like I, you, or going to an, a board of government in which you don't live. But take with you someone from the that place. community. Yeah. Leave something behind. Have with you a copy of the resolution and have five or three if possible. They probably won't. Yes. But if you get engaged, if they say, well, what is this resolution? What, what about it? And they ask you a question that only a Steve Sanacero would know the answer to, said, don't, don't fake it. Just say, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. I will get back to you, and I'll send it to your township manager so that you have it for your next meeting. In fact, you want to get back to them. You want to establish that connection and make that connection. A couple of the don'ts. Don't, no matter how 
insane the question or the approach may be. Don't answer to the Board of Supervisors, well, you're talking like a small child with a high fever. That's a crazy <laughs> question. Don't say that. Uh, that. That won't help the situation. Don't overwhelm these people. You want to win them. You want them to be inclined. If they ask you anything, what time is it? Do not tell them how to build a clock. <laughs> Give them the answer to the question. Remember, they've got an hour and a half or more of meeting to go through. They don't need to be convinced that night, and you likely aren't going to do it either, that night. So be precise. And don't underestimate relationships on the board. Don't assume they're all buddies. Some of them can't tolerate each other. <laughs> Some of them may be running for her seat. Right. So if you say to them, we would like you to pass a resolution saying today is Saturday, half of them could immediately jump up and say, no, it's not. It's the day after Friday. <laughs> We've just seen some of that. So don't assume that this is all love and hugs and kisses up there. You know, we have a lot of need for reform at every level of our government uh, here in the United States today. But I think gerrymandering is at the top of the list because if you can't have fair elections, then it throws everything else out. And I think what we're seeing today frankly, in Harrisburg, as well as Washington, is a polarization that is in large part due to gerrymandering. Because when the only election that matters is the primary election, then you've got people who are on the extremes in both parties who are unwilling to come together and compromise. And if you look at the progress we have made over the course of our history, it's always been a consequence of compromise. It's been a con consequence of adults in the room who are able to come together. And I can tell you because I've lived it. I've lived not only going through the redistricting process back in 2011 and 2012, but I've also lived with the consequences and how the stakes have been raised even higher. If you have not yet had a chance to take a look at the reapportionment website for Pennsylvania, the reapportionment commission's website, I really encourage you to do that so you understand because on that website, there are the historical maps. For the congressional districts, they go all the way back to 1931. And it's important you take a look at that, because you're going to see something when you do. Yes, there was gerrymandering in the past. This is not, you know, we know that this term goes all the way back to an early point in our history. But if you look at these maps, you'll quickly see that there is a big difference between all those previous attempts at gerrymandering by both Democrats and Republicans and what happened in 2011 here in Pennsylvania. The technology changed so much. The ability that they have with these uh, computers now to draw maps that are far more exact is like nothing before. Not only do they have voting information about who you are, what party you're registered with, and how often you vote, but they have demographic information that goes to your shopping habits in some cases, and a lot of other information that ultimately helps them model, hey, how do these people vote? Mm -hmm. So it becomes a much more uh, insidious process in a lot of ways. I'm sure you all know that there are two different processes here in Pennsylvania. For the state legislative districts, it's done by a commission made up of the four leaders of the House and Senate, Democrat and Republican alike, and a fifth person that they are supposed to choose and of course they never can, <laughs> and so it goes to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, who then chooses that person. Now the last couple of times the Supreme Court was controlled by, uh, had a majority of Republicans, they appointed a Republican, and that's how the maps became Republican maps that have kind of locked in their majority. Democrats now uh, control the Supreme Court, so under this system in 2021, Democrats will control that process. And as a Democrat, and if some of you are Democrats, you might think, well, that's great. But as Andy was saying before, these things go in cycles. And ultimately, it doesn't benefit anybody. The congressional redistricting is done as a piece of legislation. And I can tell you in 2011, 
when Republicans controlled the governorship in both houses of the state legislature. I was on the state government committee in the House, and that's where the map came. And we were given no opportunity, more than like 24 hours, to see it. And when we wanted to ask questions about it in committee, we were pretty summarily shut down. I think there are two different types of legislators you're going to come across. One type is relatively easy. These are the people who are looking at it from a policy perspective and can recognize that there is an unfairness in the current system, and you can make the logical argument as to why it needs to change. Second category is a category of legislators who are very much interested in self-preservation, <laughs> who want to get reelected, who don't want to get voted off the island. You have to have respect, and you have to treat them that way. But you also have to make it clear that if they don't ultimately do the right thing, there may well be a consequence. You need to really be a physical presence. I know you've heard people say, well, write letters, send emails. Yeah. Let me tell you. While it is true that if suddenly a legislator gets 700 emails from people in his or her district, that has an impact. It does, because you have to stand up and notice when that happens. And that's not unimportant. It is much more impactful if people show up at a district office. And it's much more impactful if they show up at a district office in large numbers. Think Gandhi, okay? <laughs> think civil disobedience, think respect, and think the ability to send the message, the underlying message, which is there is a political consequence if you're not going to support this legislation. So my name is Jeff Dempsey. Currently, I serve as the program director for Ceasefire PA. Previous to this, I was the deputy chief of staff for State Representative Kevin Boyle. Uh, his district is the 172nd. It covers a big portion of Northeast Philadelphia. A lot of people from DC and the Beltway, a lot of pollsters that are too cool for school will say, oh, it's Philadelphia, so it's all Democrats, right? No, not necessarily, right? And that district was a swing district. Previous to that, I ran his campaign. And while I worked for him in my spare time, I consulted on his brother's congressional race in the 13th, which you heard. Uh, funny how that happens, right? And, and I also consulted on some other races. So I have a legislative and sort of a, an electoral component to my background. Also, too, I think I have a, a unique viewpoint coming from the stance of a staffer, right? Because a staffer looks at the constituency, looks at legislation very differently than a member does. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. But as we know, there are 203 state representatives in the lower chamber of the General Assembly. Uh, their constituency averages about 60 to 66,000. They serve two-year terms and go up for re-election every two years or one legislative session. So they go up every two years. And currently, there's 121 Republicans and 82 Democrats. That 82 was the gift to Democrats. That was the fig. That was what Democrats got for losing. It's a far cry from passing legislation, but it is where they're at. And as Rep. Santacero said, what we saw, what this actually translates to, some Democratic seats were made safer. And they were made safer so that they could carve out Republican portions right, and give them to Republican members. He also referenced the 13th Congressional, a, a district that I'm intimately familiar with. But as you may, as many of you may know, Congressman Fitzpatrick's district, the 8th, used to actually have some of Philadelphia in it. There's a reason that Philadelphia is not in that district anymore, and it's slammed into Montgomery County, which was already progressive and liberal. It was a way of saying the 13th can be the liberal seat, and then we can pick and choose what else we want from it. There's a website called Dave's Redistricting. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this is what legislators use to draft their own maps. The way the process works is both Republicans and Democrats will draft their ideal map, what it is that they think is their ideal map. And we all know what factors they might use to determine their ideal map. They then take that to leadership to see if there's a way to make everyone happy. Right? So there's a couple of things you have to make sure. You have to make sure you still live in the district. Nobody wants to redistrict themselves out or else they can't run for office. <laughs> right? So you make sure you're still in there. But then it's an opportunity to really exclude maybe opponents, uh, maybe exclude trends, exclude ethnicities. We saw in North Carolina 
Some of these yes. districts were drawn, I believe the court said, with laser precision, precision, the idea of trying to make sure that ethnic groups voted together. Um, quite frankly, there's some instances in Philadelphia where districts that used to be predominantly African American are now predominantly Latino, right? Um, and the idea was to, to sort of find demographics that are much more favorable to an incumbent member. Can districts literally come down to like the street? Uh, Kensington and Allegheny, an intersection in, uh, in Philadelphia. It's a, I believe it's, it's not a simple four-way intersection. I think it's a five-way. And let me see if I... Okay. Kensington and Allegheny has, and I just wanted to confirm this, has three state representatives. Wow. <laughs> this is one intersection with three different state representatives. So depending on what corner you're standing on is a different legislator. Wow. So to answer your question, yes. Yes, you can. Now in the state senate, the upper chamber, there's 50 total. Their districts are a lot bigger. They have about 240,000 constituents. They have four-year terms, and they rotate. Half of the Senate will go up every four years. So your senator, just because it's an even-numbered year, may not actually be up for re-election. Currently, there's 34 Republicans to 16 Democrats. There was a lot of talk earlier, and the platitude was, you know, people don't want to get voted off of the island, right? You know, state reps and state senators, they don't want to get voted off the island. They don't want to lose. I have a supreme respect for elected officials. I think anybody who puts their name on the ballot, puts themselves out there, deserves a level of respect, even if I disagree with them on all the issues. Running for elected office is one of the most difficult things you can do. It's personally invasive. Um, it's tough. It's hard work, and it's a challenge. And moreover, if you run for office and you do it right, inevitably you will lose something. You'll blow off a friend who needed your help. You'll skip a family function you really should have been at. You maybe won't spend as much time with your spouse or your kids if you're on the campaign trail. It's rough, right? So just think, that's what these people sacrifice to get into office. But let's talk about when they get into office. It's a pretty sweet gig. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. It's a pretty sweet gig. If you're a state representative, you're making about $80,000 a year. After 10 years in the state legislature, you're fully invested for health care for the rest of your life. So after 10 years, even if you lose in that 11th year, you your spouse and your children have health care for the rest of your life. You get a break on your insurance premium for your car insurance. You get reimbursed for mileage, and you even can collect per diems, meaning that they pay you to go to work. I don't get, I mean, I get paid to do my job, but I don't get paid to physically go to work, right? But members of the General Assembly do. When I say that their salary is about $80,000, by the time you tack in the per diems, the amount of money they get paid to actually stay in Harrisburg when they're in session, or going to a committee hearing, um, the food reimbursements that they receive, we can bump that salary up to about $100,000. I think we can admit to ourselves that of the 203 members in the general, actually the 253 if you combine both the houses, there's going to be some people there who probably wouldn't normally come close to having a $100,000 a year job. Also, too, Pennsylvania has the second largest full-time legislature, meaning that they're in session all year round. All year round is a relative term because in the summertime, as soon as the budget gets passed, they usually take about two months off. <laughs> so these are the perks that we're talking about. So when we talk about not wanting to get voted off of the island, you can see the economic reasons as to why one doesn't want to get voted off the island. Harrisburg is the easiest place for them to lie to you. I mean, it really is. It's, let's just call it for what it is. You're on their turf. You're in their fancy office with, with there's a, the Capitol's beautiful. If you've not seen it, it's aesthetically pleasing, right? But you're in their office. You're on the other side of their desk, right? And it's the easiest place for them to, to lie to you. When you become a member, you are given what's called an LA, a legislative assistant. Uh, they will be sort of the face of your office in Harrisburg. But those people, those men and women, don't actually work for the member. They work for the party or the caucus. Right? So, you know, we might say party, but it's not a political sense. There is the Democratic leadership, the Republican leadership in both houses. Right? They call that the caucus. So there's the Democratic caucus in the House and the Republican caucus in the House, and in the Senate, Democrat and Republican caucuses. The people who work in Harrisburg work for those caucuses. What that means is if I were a state representative and I lose, my person in Harrisburg is still going to have a job. They'll get reassigned to another member. They'll work in a different location, but they're still going to have a job. They'll still have their benefits and so on and so forth. Your district office staff, the people who work here, the folks who work in the district offices, that's a very different relationship. Their success, their livelihood is tied to the success and the livelihood of the member. 
which is to say that the chiefs of staff, the legislative assistants, the people who answer those phone calls, they have a much more vested interest with the members and the members' success. So as we go through this process of advocating and lobbying and, and pushing our agenda, don't ever, ever, ever underestimate those people. Because not only are they the ones who care the most about how the rep does, i.e. in elections, right? But also, too, they're much more likely to have an intimately personal relationship with the rep, right? So if you want to have 50 people do a surprise visit, and you want to, you know, let's be honest, you want to scare the bejesus out of these people, right? That district office staffer is probably much more likely to have a personal relationship. So it's not, hey, rep, there's people here. It's, yo, Steve, there's 50 people outside the office, and I don't know what to do. How do we handle this? What do we say, right? So the district office staff is important to highlight. No state legislator wants to wake up and see nasty letters to the editor in their local paper. No one wants to see a story about how there's 50 people outside of their office, you know, calling for something or calling the legislator out, because that's their immediate community. How you win elections isn't turning out votes. Anybody who says, oh, we just got to get the young people to vote, that's ridiculous. They're not going to win. The easiest way to win an election is to target the people who you know will vote. This makes sense. If I know that this half of the room shows up and this half of the room doesn't, why would I spend time talking with them? Again, we're talking about economic and rational motivators to winning elective office, right? So it's the focus on the people who you know will vote. And that mindset, I think, is important to understand because it's also a way that they go about constituent service. So that's my plug to say, hey, make sure you vote, right? Because this, this ensures that you have a seat at the table. And again, they never know who you vote for, but they know how often you vote. Let's talk about the very first step of the legislative process in Pennsylvania, which is something called a co-sponsorship memo. A co-sponsorship memo does a couple key things. Number one is it allows the legislator to claim ownership of an issue. As you can imagine, there's some hot button issues, whether it be reproductive rights, LGBT rights, gun violence prevention, so on and so forth. And many legislators want it to be their bill. They want to be the ones who get to be the champion for the cause and tout it. I bring up the co-sponsorship memo for a couple of reasons, and especially in front of groups like this. You know, one thing that we as a movement, whether it's our movement at Ceasefire PA, the movement at Fair Districts PA, we have to constantly define success. What does it mean to be successful? How do we determine if our movement is being successful? This thing is useless. <laughs> if this is introduced, and this is the only thing that's introduced, your issue doesn't go anywhere. This isn't legislation. This isn't a bill number. This doesn't have, I mean, you can get co-sponsors from this, but they're not even made public. Right? So if you are dealing with a legislator or, a legis or legislators who say, no, 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 but we've got a co-sponsorship memo out there, that bill can't begin to move through the machinations of becoming a law until it's formally introduced. And this isn't it. There's a lot of things that Commonwealth of Pennsylvania does poorly. Some of the stuff that they do well is there are some pretty convenient and easy to use tools for doing advocacy work. We can find a list of all of our representatives, standing committees, and then what happens is it's going to give us our list of standing committees. We go down to state government right here. It tells me who the chair is right off the bat. But now, by going in here, we can see all of the members, both in the majority and in the minority, right? And we can easily click on their information. When it says co-sponsorship memorandum, these are bills that they have signed on to as a co-sponsor, right? So if you ever have someone say, oh, I don't really co-sponsor things, you can easily pull this up and say, well, Senator, it looks like you've co-sponsored <laughs> dozens of things. <laughs> if you notice at the bottom of this page here, there's this little thing down here that says introduced as SB. Now that's how you know that it's, it's now made the transformation from just the co-sponsorship memo to an actual bill. We know this because A, it's been assigned a bill number. And generally speaking, as soon as it gets assigned a bill number, it'll get introduced and then thrown into a committee. See, here's our bill itself, a joint resolution, so on and so forth. Once a bill is introduced and it gets an actual bill number, it goes through a process called first read. All first read means is that they'll read the bill out loud on the House floor. Uh, generally, they'll probably abridge it because there's a lot of pieces of legislation that get introduced. And then they'll immediately assign it to a committee. The committee is so very important because they are the gatekeepers. The committee chairs specifically 
And, and again, unfortunately, it is the majority committee chair. It's not the minority committee chair, it's the majority committee chair who gets to be the person who decides whether or not this comes up for a vote. Even if the chairman himself or herself is difficult to get a hold of, difficult to reach, difficult to take constituents to, that doesn't mean you shouldn't lobby the people on, you know, on it, on the, on the actual committee. And maybe when you lobby them, the question, the ask, the request isn't just to support fair districts, but is to actually say something like, hey, let's get this out of this committee. And for fair districts, that might be something you want to consider, given the fact that the chairman of the state government committee in the House is not only one of the most conservative members, this is a gentleman who literally called public transportation a form of welfare. Here is an example of a committee roll call vote. We have the committee at the top. This would be appropriations. The type of motion, meaning is the bill reported as committed, meaning that they're going to discuss it. In the Senate, they have a phrase called laid on the table which just means that they're going to punt it until later on. And then we have our, our vote summaries here. Once the bill passes out of committee, there is a time period in which amendments have to be added. Now, within the Pennsylvania House, amendments have to be added to the bill in advance. This is different from the Senate, in which amendments might be added from the floor. Second read in the House is when the fireworks happen. This is when the members put on their best suit, get their staffers to load up their cameras, and make impassioned speeches, right? This is when they legitimately try to change their membership's mind. If the bill passes second read, then it has to wait an entire day, again, for sunshine reasons, meaning that people can take a look at it and whatnot. But I won't lie, after the second day, it's pretty much done. If you're watching your bill go through the process, again, whatever your bill may be, and you hear that it's going up for second read, that's when the alarm should sound, that's when you really have to pay attention, that's when all the stuff's gonna go down. Because after third read, or after second read, when it gets to third read, it's pretty much already decided. The Senate's a little bit different. Don't be concerned because it's just a real minor thing that makes it different. Within the Senate, the first read is the same process. It gets read on the floor out loud, it gets sent to a committee. After the committee does what they wanna do with it, or the committees do what they would like to do with it, i.e., you know, amending it, changing it, bringing it forward, etc., it goes through second read. Second read in the Senate is much more of a um, formality, right? It gets placed on their calendar. But if anybody has ever watched the Senate, the Pennsylvania Senate in session, they don't really go by the calendar. In the Senate, it's third consideration. That's the fireworks. That's when you're going to have the floor speeches. And moreover, what you'll have at that time are amendments from the floor. I want to talk about the fun thing, setting up trackers onto your legislation. At the top here, we have tabs for the General Assembly, both the houses, session info, and legislation. By going into the legislation tab, this is generally a tool for looking up legislation. But all the way down at the bottom, as if they don't want you to find it, other ways to track legislation. We can click more information and it's going to give us a login page. You would just go through the process of setting it up. So there's a couple of different options that we can have here. The first of which is a daily session update. And what that's going to give me is everything that the legislature did that particular day. I also have a committee activity report that's going to do the same thing, but just for the committee. So you can specify which committee you want. The other thing that we can do is individual bill updates. It tells me that 22 is loaded into the hopper, so I'm going to hit save. Tracking your legislation is an important tool, and quite frankly, I find it to be very useful. Thank you so much. Thank you.